Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the service where we have a look at what the wise men discovered at the manger as we look at what we need to believe again. And I'm reading from the scripture from Matthew's gospel, from Matthew um, chapter 2, and we read the first 12 verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called all the people together, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod called the Magi secretly and he found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He then sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened up their treasures, and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country, to their country, by another route. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Friends, as we have a look at what it is that the Magi mean and, and their coming to the birthplace of Jesus, we realize again that this moment is a moment for the whole world to celebrate because these Magi represent for us People who are seeking God, who are searching for God, and who ultimately come to a place of surrender. You see, they help us believe again in their searching, in their seeking, and in their surrender. When we have a look at who gathers around the manger, we see that um, there are all these angels. Gary's spoken about Mary. He's spoken about Joseph. And today we speak about the Magi. And, and what's so incredible is that much of the story of Jesus is focused around what happens for the Jewish people. But it is in this moment that the birth of Jesus becomes for us a cosmic event, that we see that that God keeps calling us and resonates with our searching. In fact, God is the one who initiates our search for him. So the Magi were learned people. In fact, they were known as skillful people. That is, in fact, why they were called wise men, because they were learned and they were skillful. They were elders in their communities. They were kings. They came from the, the eastern region, probably from the Arab region, Iraq, Iran, the Arab region, the Saudi Arabian region. They had seen a cosmic stir in the universe, and it resonated with their spirits that the God of the universe was stirring and doing something dramatically different. There was a time perhaps where, where some of them had known about the Jewish people's God. Remember, the Jewish people, the people of Israel had been in Babylon in, in captivity. They had been in exile for a period of time. And so they were probably used to the scriptures. But something resonated for them in all their learning. Because these were learned people that studied the stars. They were kings. They, they, they were the leaders, the elders of their community. Something inside of them knew 
that what that star represented was all about something incredible. And so they were drawn to God calling them. If we are searching for the true meaning of Christmas, if we are longing to believe again, it starts by just opening our eyes to the cosmic move of God's Spirit calling us. The light of the star called them. And you know, for thousands of years, we have had different lights that have been calling us to the birthplace of Jesus. We've had different stars illuminating, drawing from our insides a calling towards God. And we've just celebrated the gift of, of babies and baptisms and, and the miracles of the birth and of the parenting of these parents and the, and the broader community parenting this, this amazing gift, a child that God has entrusted you with. And so often it is children that just draw us close to God. They become for us a star. They become for us an, an illumination of God's presence in our lives. But, but it's not always the good things that actually force us to search for God. Sometimes we have stars, some that have, have brought challenge and pain to us. Maybe there's a holy discontent in your spiritual life that you, you're tired of feeling lukewarm because there's nothing lukewarm about these wise men that travel from their land, from their culture, from their religion. They give it all up and they come searching and seeking for God. They pay a huge and mighty price. They are not lukewarm. They're prepared to travel across the desert in search of God. And the only thing they have is a stirring within them that there is something to be found. Perhaps for you right now that there is, there is a difficulty. Maybe there is an illness, maybe a diagnosis in, in your family or in your life that, is, that has become for you overwhelming, but it is like a star in that it is drawing your attention. It is forcing your gaze into a place. And we all come searching for meaning during Christmas. We all come searching for the true meaning of Christmas. And as we look at the Magi, we see that they found the true meaning in their search and in their surrender. Maybe it's a life stage. Maybe it's a great love. Maybe it's a new opportunity. Maybe it's something in your job. But just as we, we draw ourselves to celebrate the birth of Jesus, we are drawn to the things that are holding our gaze. And what is it that we do with them? And so this morning, I want to speak about just three things that the Magi did when they came searching for God. The first thing is that they were ready to be disrupted at the destination. You know, if we're looking for the, the, the true meaning of Christmas, we need to accept that perhaps what we imagine it will be, the destination of the true meaning, is not quite, a, quite what it is. Well, one of the things that we discover is that they were kings. They knew that the stars were telling of a king that was going to be born. They were expecting a palace where a king would be born. That is why they, they, they obviously something happened in the stars that they suddenly couldn't see the star anymore. And so their GPS coordinates were, were off. Maybe there was something that had gone wrong. And so well, where did they go? They obviously stopped in at, at Jerusalem, first of all, because that's where the king lived. And so as they, they thought, well, let's just go to the palace. It's obvious the GPS is no longer working. So they go to the palace and they say, where's, where's the king? And it actually says that Herod was completely disturbed. And so he gets so disturbed that he calls everybody the chief priest and he gets everybody around him. And it even says in the scripture that the whole of Jerusalem was disturbed. You know, if, if we're really interested in the true meaning of Christmas, the truth is, the meaning of faith and the meaning of being a Christian is a disrupted, disturbing faith. It takes us from the comfort to the discomfort. It takes us from the lands that we think are our own and it takes us to lands that are not our own. The message of Christmas is a disrupting Christmas. And so the message of the manger is disruptive. But in the disruption, we have to ask for guidance. We have to ask for God's help. Isn't it amazing that they actually asked Herod 
for more directions. These were great learned people and, and something wasn't adding up. And so they said, well, just help us. Part of the disruption of Christmas is we have to learn not to rely on ourselves. These were wise men, probably the most learned men in the region, kings. People bowed to them. And yet there was something so great about the star that they had seen that they were prepared to be disrupted, to leave their land, to leave their kingdoms. And they were prepared to go to another king and ask for help. And then they were prepared to follow the star to a place that seemed so unlikely as a place where a king would be born. The miracle of Christmas and the meaning of Christmas is a disruptive process. If we are really searching for faith, we see that from the word faith, trust, and belief, we have the same Greek word. If, if we've got to stop relying on our own knowledge. Can you see that there was a moment where, where these three wise men, these, these people that had traveled, had to stop relying on the knowledge that they had of the stars, and they also had to surrender that. Christmas is about being disrupted and about finding a space to imagine that it is more than our own ability, but to trust God with the gift of our lives. I don't know about you, but many years ago when I was a kid, we, we were planning this family holiday. It was, everyone was so excited. Some of you are going to be going on family holidays, going to be with family and friends and just getting really excited about what this Christmas is going to be about. And so we planned this family holiday. I remember the family was talking about it. This was, let me just tell you, Daniel, there was a time where you didn't have GPS that you couldn't plug in. There was a time where you had to read a map and you had to find your destination on a map. And so we were really excited about going on holiday. Everybody was coming. We were going to go to the South Coast. And at that time, you didn't have um, any apps uh, that could show you pictures of the accommodation. You just, you, you went probably by faith. And so we went to this place called Ifafa. Now that should have been enough. It was unheard of. And um, we went to this place. And I remember everybody was so excited because the whole family, the extent of everyone was getting together. And the anticipation of this journey was just so incredible. And, and I remember we arrived. And as a child, you know, you, you observe. You don't always quite, you can't always all join the dots. You, you join them when you're older, but you observe. And I was excited, so I didn't know what everybody was so tense about. But as we arrived at our destination, my mother was crying. My aunt was crying. My grandmother was very stoked. She wasn't crying but she was standing very firm. I think maybe she was chastising the person that booked the accommodation. But at the end of the day, that accommodation, there was a snake crawling up the wall. We didn't stay there. We, we, we had to move. But that destination was not what we imagined it to be. There's a lot of things that happen around Christmas that are not what we imagine them to be. But the one thing that we can hold to as Christians no matter how disrupted Christmas becomes for us, in it, in every part of the story of Jesus' birth, is the presence of God. So no matter what Christmas brings, whether there has been pain or joy, there is the presence of God. It's okay to be disrupted. The second thing that we, we look at is that we look at the gifts, and they are unlikely gifts. They are gifts of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. And when we look at these gifts, we see that these wise men, they were not Jewish people that understood what the Messiah would go through, but they were people that came from a different land, a different religion, and a different culture. And the three gifts that they bring have spoken prophetically into the life of the church for thousands of years because this is what we celebrate. When, when, they, when they bring the gifts, the first thing they do is it costs them to bring a gift at Christmas. That's why we give gifts to one another. That's why we give at Christmas. It's exactly what the, what the, the, the Magi did. They gave. They gave costly treasures. And that's why we will give presents at Christmas. 
so that it costs us. And what did they give? They gave gold. And what does gold symbolize? Gold symbolized that Jesus was royalty, that he was the king. And they affirmed that in the gifts that they gave. And when they gave frankincense, the people in the Middle East would have known that frankincense is a, is a, a herb used um, and for, for worship and for healing. And, and, and they would have known that. So they came and they declared that the king that was going to be born was going to be a healer, one to be worshipped. And then finally they brought myrrh. And, and I want to tell you that is one gift that, that a mother doesn't want to receive because, because it really symbolized death and suffering. And when they brought this embalming myrrh, they were talking prophetically about Jesus' suffering and, and that myrrh would be used for the anointing of his body. They didn't just come seeking. They saw something. They tried to understand what they saw and put it in the gifts that they brought. You know, so often I find people become religious because they are afraid of hell. And so they become religious. But true religion and true faith and a true walk in Christ is no longer about being afraid of hell, but knowing that we have been through hell and God has even been there. And so they bring these gifts symbolizing that God will be a God, that, that, that this baby Jesus, that Jesus would be a king that would change everything. You know, they, they were so open to the move and the presence and the power of God that they were ready to be, to be spoken to by an angel in a dream. And so they went on another course. And so their faith was grown. Can you imagine what faith it must have taken for people to imagine that their religion was not the way and they looked in another place for true kingship and the true God? And so what Christmas is about is Christmas is about our searching. But as we come to search, are we ready to surrender? And that's what we see symbolically with these, with, with these, these kings that come. They actually come in the, and, the, and the scripture says to us, Matthew captures us for us. And he says, they bowed down and they worshipped him and they gave their treasures they enacted, they symbolically enacted what was going on inside of them. And so often we, we reserve ourselves in our search for God. But they were prepared to become undignified in searching for the truth. And they opened themselves completely to God and they bowed before Jesus. And so then they go off, and I want to say about finally today, they go off on a different route. They take a different path. They have a new setting for their next destination. Now, when we strive to, to seek and surrender, the miracle of Christmas happens. When we strive to seek God and to surrender to God, the true miracle of Christmas happens. You know, Richard Rawls speaks about the fact that, that to finally surrender ourselves as people, we have to have three spaces opened up. If you finally want to surrender yourself to something, three spaces have to be opened up. Your head, your heart, and your body. Your head, your heart, and your body. What did Jesus say? If you want to know God, love God with your mind, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so if we're really wanting to surrender to God, and if we're really looking for faith, and if, if we are really searching, we have to allow those three areas to be surrendered. I want to draw you back to those gifts. A king would receive a crown of gold on their head. These wise men knew that. They knew that real searching means whatever is on our head, whatever is placed inside our mind, drives our lives. And so that's the meaning of Christmas. We've got to make sure that our minds are aligned with God, that we've got to search God with our mind, but not just to leave it with our mind. 
You know, the, these wise men, these learned men knew that it wasn't just the crown of gold that was on the mind of a king that would confirm him as king, but it was also what went on in his heart. And, and what goes on in our heart and our emotions is really important. That's why they gave him the frankincense. We see that what really goes on in Jesus' mind as a Messiah is a Messiah to heal and set free. So if we, if we want to be healed and set free and if we're searching for God, we, not, we don't need to just bring our mind, but we need to bring our heart. So God touches our heart. And then the miracle of Christmas begins to be born in us. And finally, when, he, when they come and, and give the myrrh, the body, we know that Jesus finally comes to a place of surrender when he says, God, into your spirit, into you I commend myself. And when Jesus comes to Gethsemane, he, he brings his body ready to, to suffer. We're looking for the miracle of Christmas. We're looking to believe again. We're looking for a faith that is a transforming faith. We need to bring our heart, our mind, and our soul and seek God and then to trust God and let everything go. I don't know what's holding your gaze. I don't know what star or what situation is capturing you at the moment. But the good news of the birth of Jesus is that we are saved by his birth. We are saved by his life and ministry. We are saved by his healing. We are saved by his death. But we are also saved by his resurrection. Christmas brings us to a miracle of searching and surrendering. So I want to give you a challenge today. When you get home tonight, wait till it's really dark. Maybe nobody's around. Maybe you're still with your family and friends. and Maybe you've got a Christmas tree at home. But wait until all the lights are off. Put all the lights off in the house. Sit together either on your own or as a family. And if you don't have a Christmas tree, get a candle. And, and light the Christmas tree or light the candle. And capture for a moment whatever you are searching for. Just think about it. Bring it to God. Maybe you can be as bold as, as these, these kings and, and maybe bow down. And just give that to God tonight. Whatever you're searching for. And allow the light of that Christmas tree. Because that's really why we put lights on the Christmas tree. It's because of the star that led the light that will not put out darkness. And as you come and you bring that to God, open yourself up for God's miracle to touch you. Let's pray together. And so, Lord God, we, we think today of, of the star that illuminated a path from a very unknown land to a very unlikely cave in the middle of the hills of Bethlehem. So often, Lord, we live our lives because we are afraid of hell. We just don't have the courage to believe that it is even in hell that you find us. And so we pray, Lord, that the miracle of your presence and the birth of Jesus would touch us and shape us and heal us and bless us. We want to be the light of the world. We forget that we are the stars that people follow. They follow who we are. And so we want to surrender ourselves to you. We want to thank you that you have brought things into our lives that draw our gaze. And we pray, Lord God, that in that place we will find your miraculous presence that you become the illumination, not just for this year, but for what is to come. And so we thank you for the courage of these people that we're ready to seek and surrender. Give us the same courage, we pray, in Jesus' name.
Amen.